Voters in our region are looking to cast their vote in the upcoming general election. Northwest Public Broadcasting and the League of Women Voters of Benton and Franklin Counties want you to know the candidates. Recorded at the Washington State University Tri-Cities Campus, this is Vote 2023. Good evening and welcome to the 2023 General Election Candidate Forums. My name is Ravine Jimenez and I am a member of the League of Women Voters of Benton and Franklin Counties. The League is a nonpartisan organization that neither supports nor opposes any candidate. In presenting these forums, it is our goal to provide opportunities for voters to become better informed about the people who are running for public office. These general election forums have been pre-recorded in person by Northwest Public Broadcasting at the WSU Tri-City Studio. They will also now be available through November 7th, Election Day, on the Northwest Public Broadcasting YouTube channel on the League's website and Facebook page, through the Columbia Basin Badger Club and the cities of Richland and Pasco. Before I turn the program over to our moderator, Matt Loveless, from Murrow College of Communication, WSU Pullman, I would like to bring your attention to our League's Vote video, featuring the wonderful Pasco High School dance team, and remember, be a voter. The League of Women Voters of Benton and Franklin Counties presents, It's time to vote. It's simple. All you need to be is, a U.S. citizen, 18 years or older, and a resident of Washington State. Jump into this opportunity today. There is still time to register, so don't pull out. Take time and visit your local county elections office. Your vote, your voice, your future. Visit lwv-vf.org and get ready to vote in the next election. Well, hello out there. Welcome to Northwest Public Broadcasting and part four of our series of debates and forums and our vote 2023 election coverage. Thank you as always to the League of Women Voters for all of their work on this. Great partners as we work to help our voters just get a little more information on each race appearing on their ballots in the counties. And here on night four, we're looking at the city of Pasco. Some school board positions will air the first of several city council debates. And we'll have one pretty straightforward debate here tonight and another that will take the shape of a forum. Before I go over the rules for tonight, a note that despite the efforts of the league, not everybody can or is willing to show up. We will still address every single race. Now things that will remain consistent, each candidate will get one minute for an opening statement. We'll follow that with a series of questions, one minute time limits for each of those as well. So a simple 60 seconds. The candidates have not seen the questions, but we believe they get to the heart of some of the big issues in Pasco and in the school district. And we will all do our best to stay on time and off, on topic for the sake of fairness and of course transparency. And with that out of the way, we do have a little shuffling in today's program. This segment, to put it simply, has three candidates in studio with me, all vying for the Pasco School Board. That's a simple way to say it, but none of them against each other. So here's what I'll do over the next few minutes. Each candidate here will give an opening statement. We'll follow each with either a note or a statement about or from their opponent. Then during our questions, we'll loop in the three of you just to do a Q&A. We'll give you each the same questions and give you time to answer them. So let's start with Pasco Schools Director 1, a race featuring Vincent Guerrero and Steve Norberg. I get that correct? Yes. We're one for one so far. The incumbent is Mr. Guerrero here. Mr. Norberg did send in a statement. We will air that in a moment. But first, Mr. Guerrero, can we get your opening statement, sir? Sure. I brought it and I'm going to read it if you don't mind. Just fine. So um, again, my name is Vincent Guerrero, running for past school board uh, district one position. I was born and raised in eastern Washington. My parents are farmers and continue to farm to this day. I have a master's degree in public administration. I am a Pasco Kiwanian member. Um, whose duty is to serve all children. And I'm also a Meals on Wheels board member whose duty is to serve seniors of both Benton and Franklin counties. Um, I have over 20 years experience working with people of different demographics and abilities. I'm also uh, currently um, a board member for the Pasco School District and I was appointed this past spring. I have two young children in Pasco School District schools and the reason I'm running for Paso School Board is uh, because I feel the need to give back to the community and my own children. One issue that I feel needs to be uh, constant, uh, is, the constant is the constant attention of the district's rapid growth. Funds and resources and services need to be used wisely so that we are responsible to the taxpayer and to the children. 
Another uh, issue is positive forward progress as I do now and if I am elected I will continue to work um, hard and make sure that the school district continues to have positive forward growth. The only way to resolve other issues is to work collaboratively, collaboratively and it, with a nonpartisan view. Um, vote for me, Vincent Guerrero, Paso School Board, District 1. All right, Mr. Guerrero, thank you very much. And Steve Norberg, like I mentioned, challenger in this race, he did send in a statement. We will have that read now. Hi. I am Steve Norberg, and I am running for District 1 position of the Pasco School Board. First, I want to thank the League of Women Voters of Benton and Franklin Counties and Northwest Public Broadcasting, WSU, for informing the public about the candidates for our next election and the opportunity to share my background and vision for the Pasco School District. I also want to thank you, the voters, for listening and educating yourself as you direct our schools during a critical time in our nation's history. Please let me share a little about myself. I grew up in western Nebraska on a family farm. I received my Bachelor of Science degree and Master of Science degree from the University of Nebraska. I then received my Ph.D. degree from Oregon State University in crop science in 1991. After my doctorate, I've worked in university extension for 27 years. My family moved to Washington in 2011 when I accepted a position with Washington State University to serve as professor with the working title as Extension Regional Forage Specialist for the Columbia Basin and I'm housed at the Franklin County Extension Office. For those not familiar with Extension, my charge is to educate practicing farmers and agribusiness with new research-based information to increase production and increase environmental stewardship. Just this summer, I received a national award, the Distinguished Service Award for Excellence in my 27 years of Extension. For the past 12 years, I have served as the WSU ex officio for the Washington State Hay Growers Association, as well as Hay King Superintendent for the Benton Franklin County fair. I serve as a mentor with Forge Youth Mentoring to a 15-year-old, and I'm very active in a local church. I believe Pasco's future lies with our kids. Our kids deserve the best education possible to prepare them for success. Success is accomplished by teaching them the basics of reading, writing, arithmetic, and learning how to become independent, lifelong learners. My conservative values and leadership will help guide Pasco schools to ensure a healthy learning atmosphere and result in students that are well prepared for their future. As evidence of my conservative values, I am endorsed by the Franklin County Republican Central Committee. It is critical for parents to be involved with their child's education, and the school should encourage this and not interfere with their relationship or parental rights. I will do my best to wisely use the finances that are available. I have written and managed budgets, people, and resources to accomplish research and extension programs, including a national team of eight professors. My coursework in teaching methods and experience in teaching will assist me in my leadership and wisdom to the Pasco School District. And next up, the Director 2 race. That features another incumbent, Mr. John Kennedy. Mr. Kennedy is in studio. His opponent, Gabriel Lucatero, is not participating, and we did not get a statement. So, Mr. Kennedy, you get the minute to yourself here for your opening statement, Thank sir. You. Well, thank you to the League of Women Voters for organizing this candidate forum. My name is John Kennedy, and I am proud to serve as your school board member for District 2, which includes East and Central Pasco and the downtown. I'm running for re-election to the Pasco School Board to continue to serve as an advocate for our students and their families. I believe our schools should focus on the basics. Access to career and technical education, raising student test scores in math and language arts, and safe bus routes that working families can depend on. There's still more work to do, but we can't let divisive politics impact education. Our students' education and their futures are too important. I promise to continue to be a school board member who will listen to all of our community's diverse voices. I respectfully ask for your vote. Thank you. Mr. Kennedy, thank you very much. And finally, the Director 5 position in a similar situation here for this program. The incumbent is here, Rosa Torres. Thank you for being here. Um, the sitting board member in position 5 facing Steve Simmons. Mr. Simmons did not respond to our invitation to be here. So, Ms. Torres, we'd like to get your opening statement. 60 seconds to you now. Oh, thank you. Thank you for having me today. Um, and thank you for the League of Women Voters for organizing this. As, um, as always, I really appreciate the opportunity. A um, little bit about myself. I am born and raised in Pasco, Washington. Um, I am a uh, Pasco School District graduate, proud um, Pasco High graduate. Um, then later went to Gonzaga University and uh, received my bachelor's in accounting. And then I have my MBA also from the University of uh, Notre Dame in Indiana. And so 
um, you know, I've had a vast uh, professional career before returning home. And now that I'm here, I want to continue um, my commitment to community service and serving um, the community that saw me grow up and the um, district that gave me the opportunity to have a good education and be able to build a life um, after that. And so my commitment to the district is to um, continue um, doing the work that we need to to focus on our kids, to give them the opportunity and the resources that they need. And, um, and thank you for having me today. And we just heard from Rosa Torres with her opening statement. Now, I want to let viewers in on a little bit of Inside TV stuff when it comes to this forum. The League of Women Voters had reached out to Steve Simmons. We've already said in this program that we did not hear back from him. The League would like to apologize for a mistake and a missed email. Mr. Simmons did respond, but we just happened to miss it. What we wanted to do in this portion of the segment is let Mr. Simmons give his opening statement, and we're going to give him some time to do that. You may hear later in this program program that he could not be here. We just wanted to let you know that he did respond and here he is as part of his program for the school district. My name is Steve Simmons. I'm running for election to the Pasco School Board Director Position 5 at large because I'm concerned that public education policy in Washington state is being driven away from traditional values and conservative ideals such as limited government, local control, and parental rights in favor of state centralized authority, common core, and mandated curriculum. I'm concerned that the policies and proposals at state education organizations such as WSSDA, OSPI, and the Department of Education are trending away from common sense ideals such as a parent's right to ensure their children are educated according to their morals and values. I'm concerned that education has abandoned the family as a formative institution of our society and community. I want to ensure that Washington State and the Pasco School Board do not deviate from their responsibility to represent families, students, and teachers, and are not beholden to agendas, organizations, and special interest groups. My priorities as a board member will be grounded in the following. I believe as the primary stakeholders, parents are responsible for their children's education per their values and beliefs. This means that parental permission should be required for students to access services and participate in non-curricular clubs and activities. Parents must have reasonable access to monitor curriculum and educational materials. I believe generally private communication between educators and students must not be kept from parents. I believe the school board must work as a governance team to help fulfill Washington State's constitutional mandate to provide ample education to every student. As John Taylor Gatto said, education should make you a unique individual, not a conformist, and furnish you with an original spirit with which to tackle the big challenges. K-12 public education must focus on the basics such as reading, writing, and arithmetic. Curricula should be knowledge-based. Emphasis and funding should be placed on the arts. Instructional materials and books should be age appropriate and must not indoctrinate students contrary to their parents' wishes. State mandated and common core curricula should be minimized. Parents must be able to reinforce in the home what is being taught in the classroom. As an electrician by trade, I believe the emphasis should not be on college alone, but also on skilled career training as a graduation pathway. I believe an important role of education and government is to help develop an informed citizenry. This means students are taught what it means to be a citizen of our nation and to appreciate and value the best parts of our constitutional republic and heritage. Informed citizenship means a balanced and accurate view of American history must be taught. Students should understand the principles behind our founding documents. Public education must emphasize a student's identity as a citizen over their identity as a member of a special interest group. I believe school finance Finances should address current and future needs while enacting savings and reducing costs on district families. Cost-conscious and conservative spending policies should be practiced. Focus is placed on competitive bidding, transparency, and avoiding conflicts of interest. Bonds and levies placed before the voting public are appropriate for the needs of the district. Teachers must be provided with the supplies and resources they need. I would be honored to serve as a member of the Pasco School Board in position 5 at large. I will work to ensure a district that is limited and accountable, reduces red tape, and serves families, students, and teachers. Please vote for Steve Simmons on Tuesday, November 7th.
Well, hopefully we made some sense of that, and thank you for your patience. A unique forum here since none of you are in a race against each other, but all of you currently serving on the Pasco School Board. So let us have this as a getting to know you better sort of segment. We have six planned questions from the League of Women Voters of Benton and Franklin County. And the first is a bit purposely broad, um, just sort of looking at your priorities. We'll start with you, Mr. Guerrero. Um, in your opinion, what's the most challenging issue currently facing the Pasco School District, and how would you address it? So I, I think the, the most pressing issue is actually rapid growth. Uh, we've gone from 40,000 people, just under 40,000 people 20 years ago to now over 80,000 people. And it puts a lot of stress on infrastructure, a lot of stress on um, the faculty as well as um, the district as a whole. And so I think with the rapid growth and all the schools being built that we need to use uh, funds wisely and make sure that um, each child receives a qu quality education um, and that uh, nobody gets lost in, in the rapid growth process. All right, screw up. Thank you very much. Mr. Kennedy, same question. Yeah, I def definitely agree with Director uh, Mr. Guerrero on, on the issue that uh, our growth is uh, the major issue that we're facing. Uh, we just passed a bond this past uh, February to build a third comprehensive high school and an innovative high school in East Pasco. So I think that as we uh, continue to grow in population that the effective, smart management of that growing population is going to be the primary um, responsibility and opportunity for our district over the next several years. And I also agree with Mr. Guerrero that uh, the transparent management of our taxpayer dollars is also crucially important. And so I think those are things that we have to keep in mind um, going forward. And just to add one other point to that, it, it, point to your question, uh, Matt, is I also think the emotional and social well-being of our students is of paramount importance. We have just sort of transitioned out of the pandemic and a lot of our students experienced a lot of um, uh, challenges during remote learning. And now we're fully back in the classroom and we're still kind of grappling with the uh, effects of that. So I think focusing on social, emotional, well-being, uh, mental health for our students is, is another uh, uh, priority of ours, okay. should be. Mr. Kennedy, thank you very much. Same question to you, Ms. Torres. Yeah, um, I think the points that um, my fellow uh, candidates have brought up are exactly what, um, what we're facing right now with the rapid growth and um, with our students returning back to the classroom. Um, the other thing that I would add is a priority for me at least is um, that we focus on um, closing the achievement gap that, that we have right now with our students. Um, you know, with the rapid growth, with returning from COVID, you know, we've seen an we've seen an impact in the test scores of our students and their ability to learn and achieve at the same levels as some of the other kids across the state. And so, um, you know, my uh, my one of my goals is to you know increase the investment that we've had in our programs that are that are helping that that are helping our kids learn better, learn um, in a in a in a way that they can understand and um, and see consistent growth over their um, career within the, the school district. Um, that's one of the things I think that we really need to um, keep our eye on and that we don't let um, you know other issues come around that, uh, that detract from that because at the end of the day, that's what we're trying to do is, such, is uh, provide you know, quality education for all our students. All right, Ms. Torres, thank you very yeah. much. Well, question number two, Mr. Kennedy, we'll start with you on this one. And a reminder of the rules, we'll sort of rotate with first answer here. Some people consider that a benefit, <laughs> some don't. Uh, the school board positions, of course, are nonpartisan. Uh, so how would you demonstrate nonpartisanship uh, and free from political influence, free from ideological talking points mm -hmm. in your candidacy and your work as a school board member? Yeah, this is an excellent question. Uh, I, so I've joined the board in December. I was elected in a special election last year. And I think I've worked very hard to make sure that uh, my priorities are the district's priorities. I'm not trying to implement a personal agenda. I have no personal agenda other than seeing our students succeed and thrive. Um, and I think that's crucially important for all school board directors is to not come in with specific uh, policy goals that they want to enforce on the board or enforce on our district that the board operates as one, we operate as a team, and any district policies that we pursue must be done in a consensus-oriented way. And that's my approach as a board director. I'm very collaborative, and I believe in consensus-oriented policy making. Um, in addition to that, I believe that school board directors should not be seeking party endorsements. 
Um, if you seek the party endorsement, it implies that you you agree and want to implement in some form or fashion that party's platform. That doesn't mean we don't have our ideas, we don't have our philosophies, but like I said, uh, being a school board director is a team effort and we have to be able to um, listen to all views and I make sure I do that and incorporate all views into our decision making process and that all our decision making process has broad consensus in our community. Ms. Kennedy, thank you. Ms. Torres, uh, that same question, just mm -hmm. how, how do you make sure that your position as a board member is nonpartisan? Yeah, I mean, I take um, a very similar approach that Dr. Kennedy has um, brought up about being collaborative. Um, that is the way how things get done um, in reality. If, if we're decisive, if we are uh, divisive, then, um, then we're not going to be able to get anywhere. And so that's my approach as well, is to try to work with my fellow directors to um, try to get the best um, work done for our district and our kids and keeping that at the focus of, um, of decision making and how I work. Um, the other thing that I would say is my position is at large. So there is no room for partisanship in that because I represent all of Pasco. Um, I represent the total community. Um, it's my job to understand the concerns of all of our community members and our families and our students and our staff. And so um, for me, that's how I think I, I approach the work is to always remember that, is to make sure that you know I am um, a person that can represent the views um, across our, our community. All right, thank you very much. Mr. Guerrero, same question. So along with um, Ms. Torres and uh, Dr. Kennedy, I, I feel the same way. Um, there's, the position is nonpartisan. It should be nonpartisan. I am conservative by nature. I'm a Christian, and I don't feel that um, any one of those ideologies need to be brought into, um, into any kind of discussion, debate, and moving forward with, with you know, with schools, um, but um, I, I also think that we need to move forward as collaboratively, as a team, and we continue to do that today. Um, we all work well together. We all have different views, um, and we know that, um, that we have those views, but we work together as a team to move forward, and I think that's primarily what we need to do is, is forward progress without issue. And um, I think that if we all remain that way, um, con consensus will be, will be had. All right, Ms. Guerrero, thank you very much. Well, question three, Ms. Torres, you go first here. And this is a topic that at any given time feels political, certainly mm -hmm. feels personal, and that's banning books. Um, and as I've said to other people in these races, maybe even you take exception with that term when it comes to them in schools, but what's your position on keeping certain books out of schools? Um, in the Pasco School District, and how do you balance maybe what you believe personally versus what you think should be in our school libraries? Yeah, um, I think it's an issue that is, um, again, very div uh, divisive in our community. Um, but me personally, I don't believe in banning books. Um, I believe that we need to have equal access to information and resources for all our students. Um, there are obviously things that are not age appropriate or, you know, appropriate from the standpoint of having them in the schools, um, you know, that are not education based or um, don't serve the, the, um, the, the greater good of our, <laughs> of our kids. Um, but the general idea of banning books is not something I support. Um, I think that it's um, an issue that's being used to detract from um, the things that we actually have to um, do in our schools, right? Um, uh, frankly speaking, we have bigger fish to fry, right? We have to focus on our kids being able to learn, um, getting the math and reading skills that they need to, um, you know, graduate and be productive uh, citizens in our um, community. And so that's really my focus is I don't try to focus on those kind of issues that are um, detracting from our, the real business of the school district. Thanks, Ms. Suarez. Same question, Mr. Guerrero. So repeat the question again. Yeah, the question was, uh, how do you feel about the topic of banning books and how do you balance maybe what you think personally versus what you think school libraries should have in them? So um, uh, I, along with Mrs. Torres, I don't think that we should ban any books. Really, it's up to the parents to help monitor any kind of information that the, the kids receive or read. Um, you hear all kinds of bad things on the news every single day, and I tend to monitor that what what the kids re my kids receive 
Um, and really, to tell you the truth, if we were going to ban a book, why don't we start with banning any kind of um, um, books that have information such as, um, um, can, I'm, I'm going blank here. <laughs> so um, anyhow, information um, based on um, um, I'm losing it. <laughs> no, that's okay. It, 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 the reason I asked the question, we come just short of saying, what do you think of this book? What do you think of this book? What do you think of this book? Which is not what we're trying to do in this. Uh, but just curious about your thoughts, maybe when a parent comes to you with a problem. So when a parent comes to me with a problem, you know, based on books, I, I really think it's the, um, the, it's the parent's duty to help monitor um, the children. And so it's really up to them. Thank you very Thank much, you. Mr. Guerrero. Mr. Kennedy, same question to you. Well, like Ms. Torres and Mr. Guerrero, I do not support banning books. Um, I think one of the most important priorities that a s public school has is to make sure our students are critical thinkers. Critical thinking is the necessary tool for success in our economy and our society. And so uh, the public school provides a safe environment where critical thinking can take place and where students can develop their critical thinking skills, again, in a safe environment with educators. And that is where uh, uh, ideas from a variety of different perspectives and stories from different perspectives, information from different sources can be introduced in that safe environment where the educator can guide the student and help, again, develop that critical thinking. Um, even with controversial books, right? It's important for us to be able to, be able to, um, to examine, analyze, and break down arguments and understand what might be uh, propaganda, what, not, what, what might not uh, be propaganda, for example. And so I don't, wanna, I don't want us to censor that, uh, that um, education and that, uh, de uh, that uh, development of critical thinking. I think parents have a role to play in monitoring, like Mr. Guerrero says, that what their students are reading. Um, I believe in uh, age-appropriate uh, content in our schools, but I don't believe that we should censor and we should work with our parents to make sure that uh, they uh, have a role to play in making sure that they're, um, uh, that they're comfortable with what their, students are, what their children are reading. Okay, thank you very much. I know it's a, it's a nuanced question, it, even the term banning books, like I said. Um, we could probably spend an hour talking about it, even what makes a book controversial itself. Uh, We'll leave that for another day in another program. Well, question four, serving a diverse and growing population, obviously here uh, in Pasco. The question, to what degree do you believe all voices should be represented in the selection of a curriculum? Why or why not? And if you agree in practice, how could you do something like that, Mr. Guerrero? So I think we need to incorporate all voices in the curriculum. Um, you can't decide on curriculum based on um, one population, or one demographic. I think that moving forward, we need to include um, the diverse demographics that we have here in Pasco. And um, I think that uh, not only does do the administrators, but the board, the school board, need to take that into account. And moving forward, it, it needs to be something that's collaborative, um, mutual, and um, that works for all. All right, thanks, Ms. Grom. Uh, and Mr. Kennedy, I uh, just sort of uh, restating the question, how do you get all voices involved, but practically apply that when it comes to putting a curriculum together? Well, we have a standard policy in the Pasco School District of how curriculum is implemented. There, there is uh, committees where educators and district staff and parents have a role to play on those committees to advise the school board on curriculum. Um, there, we always welcome opportunities for public comment and we, we seek opportunities for public comment where parents can come in and speak or send us emails and express their views on specific curriculum that's being um, reviewed every uh, several years. Um, it's our job as school board directors to seek out the views of our constituents and to make sure that we're listening to all voices in the Pasco School District. That's my approach, right? It's not to just listen to a specific number of voices, but to seek out and hear everyone and to get their views and to incorporate all that information to my decision-making processes. Um, I believe in age and development the appropriate curriculum, and I think that our process in the Pasco School District allows for the adoption of age and developmentally appropriate curriculum. And I, again, I, I seek the, support, the, uh, endor the uh, contributions and the um, uh, participation of parents in that process. I think they have to be part of the process, and I definitely support that. Ms. Torres, same question to you as well. 
Yeah, um, I think both the Mr. Guerrero and Dr. Kennedy have kind of covered exactly um, how I feel about it. Um, we do have a process um, to review and um, and invite our parents and our um, community to come in and, and give uh, their viewpoints on curriculum. Um, it's not a one-time only shot either. Um, you know, as Dr. Kennedy mentioned, it's a continuous process that we invite our community and our families to be part of. Um, we also feel like if there is a specific issue that uh, parents, you know, don't agree with or that we need to work on, you know, we're more than willing to um, have an open door policy to, to address those items and, and as they come up. Um, I think one other thing that I can add to the conversation here is that um, as, you know, we continue to grow as a community and we have more and more diverse uh, perspectives, you know, we um, are, uh, opening the door for those perspectives to come in. You know, at our school board meetings, we have um, public comment time that we set aside every single board meeting. Um, we also invite our community uh, to come in and uh, be part of our ambassador program to learn more about how the, dis the district um, approaches different um, items within our district so that they can become educated and be part of the process. So, you know, there's a multitude of ways that our district is being proactive in inviting the community to give them, to give us their perspectives. And um, like Dr. Kennedy said, you know, we, we take that seriously and we take that into account when we make policy. Thank you very much. Question five from the League of Women Voters, and Dr. Kennedy will start with you. The culture wars, as you could call them, uh, seem to be resulting in a loss of school staff, uh, teachers in particular, but of course not just teachers in the district. Um, do you agree with that or not? And if so, what strategies would you suggest for attracting and retaining PASCO teachers during the shortage? Well, I, I believe that the guiding star for our district, and I believe we, our district follows this guiding star, is to treat all of our educators and staff with, with, with respect and to acknowledge that they are experts in their fields and they provide expertise which benefits our students. So a culture of respect is absolutely crucial and it will help retain our talent, our educators um, in our district. I, I think that the Pasco School District over the last few years has avoided um, what some might call, quote, the culture wars, thankfully, because such um, incidents divide our community. And my approach as a board director is to help keep our, our board, our community unified, uh, to, pr to pursue consensus in our community, um, and to avoid uh, culturally divisive issues. I don't think the school board should um, address culturally divisive issues because it will divide the community, um, and that uh, it takes away from the consensus oriented policy driven process and that's what we have to be doing all right thank you very much Ms. Torres same question to you yeah um, I, I agree I can't agree more with Dr. Kennedy um, I think some of the things that we do as a district as well for our teachers and to retain them and, and attract them to our district is you know where we invest in professional development we are um, you know a district that is looking to um, to do the best with for our for our kids and so we are continuously always investing in the in our teachers because they are the front line and they are the ones um, you know working with our students day to day um, I think one of the other things as a district that we um, address to in order to retain and and, um, and keep our good staff is also listen to them. You know, we, we have a, a, a very good communication with our staff, with our superintendent. Um, I think that that is one of the things that, you know, uh, makes a difference because if teachers are feel like they're being heard, um, we can address things as they come up. Um, we can address uh, their concerns, um, what's uh, worrying them, and so that we can do better as a, as a board and as a district and work together. Um, and I think lastly, you know, one of the things that, um, that is also, um, like Dr. Kennedy mentioned, that is, uh, that's been really good for PASCO is that, you know, we keep our focus on our kids. We keep our focus on what's best uh, for our children and for the families that uh, make up our community. So I think both our staff and our board, um, keeping that at the forefront has helped um, maintain a, a stable and collaborative board and, and district. Thank you. And Mr. Guerrero, that same question. So um, along with Dr. Kennedy and Mrs. Torres, I, I think that culture wars are um, quite decisive, uh, divisive, excuse me, and we need to kind of steer away from that. I think that we need to allow for um, proper ed education, continuous education for teachers, uh, support them wherever we can. Lines of communication need to remain open at all times. 
at any time um, we can have, um, and, and I hope that they would, teachers email us, and they have. Um, they emailed us with problems, situations that we're, they're hoping that we can help um, resolve. And, um, and I think that going forward, we need to continue that open communication. Uh, we can't simply close the doors because somebody else, um, somebody else doesn't have the same views as you. Um, so culturally, I think there's a wide range of different cultures, different perspectives, different attitudes, and different thoughts um, on how to move forward. But I think cl collaboratively, we need to, um, to move forward as a group and um, collectively. All right, thanks, Mr. Guerrero. All right, question six. This is our final one in this forum. And, you know, numbers are out there. COVID-19 had an effect on student learning. Now, this isn't meant to break down that data, but rather to bridge the gap that the pandemic helped cause. So what can school board members do to help facilitate some of those gaps in learning? Dr. Kennedy, I believe you addressed that a bit in your opening statement um, that students have been reportedly experiencing. Ms. Torres, you go first with this one. Okay. Um, yeah, definitely COVID-19 has had a, a, a huge impact on our kids and, and how they've been able to come back to school and, and start learning again, right? And so I think one of the most important things that as a board that we can do is make sure that, um, that we're investing in, in um, our students to, to regain that ground that was lost during the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, you know, we also offer, you know, kind of those ancillary services um, that will help students um, get back to school. Um, you know, we have a program that helps students if they're having um, any mental health issues. We have we offer our kids um, therapy online um, at home. Um, if they need to have a meeting with um, a therapist um, at during school hours, we can make that happen. Um, you know, we are we are trying to take a holistic approach to our students coming back to school and, and regain that ground from the pandemic. Um, the other thing that I think is really important as a board that we can make sure is that we listen to our community and hear what their needs are. How are our students um, doing now that they're back in the in the classroom? And what are the things that we can do um, to, you know, um, help them, give them the resources um, to make them successful again? And so, um, you know, it's, it's a hard, long road. and We've never been here before, but I think um, working together is how we are going to regain that ground. As somebody in secondary education, you list all sorts of these things that are very much new world when it comes mm -hmm. to how we deal with it. I wonder your input here, Mr. Guerrero, on how you help close those gaps as a board member. So along um, with uh, Ms. Torres, I think that we need to take in information from parents and students um, and see what their needs are um, to move forward. The pandemic really threw a wrench into everything, and, and there's a huge gap there that... Um, uh, that really affected kids, uh, children, even parents. Um, so I think that resources need to be put out where uh, families can access those resources as well as students. Students should be able to go to faculty or even um, some, some specialists and say, you know, I'm not quite doing well here. Help me um, move forward. And so I think that, uh, like I said, open communication not only with parents, uh, faculty, um, staff and and children uh, can help bridge that gap. All right, Ms. Guerrero. Thanks, Dr. Kennedy. Same question to you, sir. Well, I think it's the role of the Pasco School Board to be a partner with our superintendent, Michelle Whitney, district staff, and our families, our, our parents and our district families. The district has a strong plan for student acceleration to help the students who've struggled during COVID catch up and get back to where they need to be developmentally. Uh, we, as Ms. Torres and Mr. Guerrero says, we have one of the best, if not the best in my view, mental health programs for our students and we should continue to offer a robust both virtual and in-person mental health um, services for students who need it or continue to need it. And again, we have to be open with our parents. You know, it's our job as school board directors to provide constituent services for the parents, the families, and the community members of the Pasco School District. So when parents need help, with their students and they're struggling, they can come to us and we can provide uh, assistance as best we can, um, particularly in terms of connecting them with the superintendent and the school resources um, that they may need. So I think that's the, that's the role of the board is to be a partner with all our community members, our, our students and their families. 
I'll tell you what, as a teacher and as a parent of a couple of elementary school age kids, I could sit and talk about education for a long time, but unfortunately, that's all the time we have for our forum here. I want to thank you for being here. Lots of good topics in there. And for clarity, again, we had Vincent Guerrero here running for the Director 1 position on the school board against Steve Norberg. Dr. John Kennedy here running for Director 2 against Gabriel Lucatero. And Rosa Torres running for Director 5 at large against Steve Simmons. Thanks so much for your time. Thank, thank, you. You. thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And that now allows us to turn our attention to the Pasco City Council. We'll wrap up this program looking at the first of four races. All candidates in those four races have committed to being here. That includes those running for position two. Those two are incumbent J.R. Campos and challenger Charles Grimm. Gentlemen, thank you for being here. Thank you for your time. We have explained the rules. That leads us to opening statements. As I said, you have one minute each to be able to do that. Mr. Campos, you're up first for your minute. Just happy to be here. Uh, currently, again, uh, as an appointee for District 2, right now I'm seeking an election. This won't be a re-election, be an election, uh, my first. Um, hardcore Pasco kid. I've born and raised in Central Pasco, the district I'm trying to represent, and I'd like to continue to do so. All right, Mr. Campos, thank you very much. Thank nice you. to have you here today. And Mr. Grimm, your opening statement, sir. Thank you. First of all, I'd like to thank the League of Women Voters for hosting this forum, allowing us to come and speak to the heart of, you know, what is going on in Pasco. I'm a father of five kids. I own a business in Pasco with 20 employees. And really, this is just about fighting for our quality of life, the best opportunity for human flourishing. It starts in our own home, in our business, and I'm hoping to reflect that at the Pasco City Council. We cannot allow Pasco to become what we're seeing in the big west side cities. We need to fight crime. We need to support our police. We need to just ensure we have a great quality of life here in Pasco. That's what brought my wife and I here almost 20 years ago to raise a family. And we just, we have to, you know, work within our community to protect that and make sure that it is a great place to raise children, have a family, and to live a life that matters. All right, Mr. Grimm, thank you very much. And here's where we start with some questions. These gentlemen are written and gathered by the League of Women Voters of Benton and Franklin Counties. Uh, we've got six questions planned for this debate. We'll begin with the topic of growth for the first one. And Mr. Campos first, uh, because PASCO continues to experience growth. The question in relation to that is what in additional infrastructure might be needed to deal with it? And how would you encourage your council, your fellow council members to help? That's a great question. Roadways are some of the biggest ones. As we see astronomical growth throughout the city of Pasco, roadways continue to be a thorn in everyone's side. Um, it has happened in the last, since I've been on council, we've had our planning to manager, Jacob Gonzalez, work on putting a master transportation improvement plan in place. And so as we see the city continue to grow, we're gonna implement that plan. Now it's up to council to help make sure that that plan is actually implemented. And when we get to those bridges, so to speak, we're gonna have to, as a council, agree on what we've put in that master plan. All right, Mr. Campos, thank you very much. And uh, Mr. Grimm, same question to you. If, uh, if you had an opportunity to get on this council and, and help in terms of transportation manage growth, how would you get your fellow council members to support it? Well, you know, first of all, it's collaborating to work together, but I think the key is, is just looking at the infrastructure. Like um, Mr. Campos said, it is making sure we have bridges, making sure our avenues are wide up. Um, unfortunately, West Pasco is known in the Tri-Cities as probably one of the worst places to go to as far as a commuter. And I know people that steer away from the area just for that fact. And we need to be doing things that are going to draw people to Pasco, get them to spend their money in Pasco or enjoy their, their free time in Pasco. And so a lot of the, the need there is in West Pasco, but we need to look at it as a whole, not only working with the other municipalities in Richland and Kennewick to make sure that we're all interconnected because we really are, but at the same time, you know, having vision, having leadership and really just putting Pasco first and make sure that it is the 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 place that people will want to come to, that people aren't trying to get out of. And I think just at that core, it is in West Pasco with the new Broadmoor development, making sure the Road 100 interchange is going to be feasible to move people where Road 68 can't at this point. Okay, Mr. Grimm, thank you very much. All right, let's move on to question number two. And obviously the job here is to represent your community. Um, if elected, how would you respond to complaints from constituents and or businesses about any number of topics? What would be your process if somebody comes to you with a complaint? Mr. Grimm, I'll let you start here. 
I've spent my entire adult life serving people. I think the first part of that is just being a great listener, listening to them. Obviously, they have taken the time, it's important enough to them to bring that up to you. And so really it's listening and until you hear exactly what they want, what their need is, you know, it's not just to brush it off or to blow it off, but it's important to that person. And then it is, you know, working with um, other people, working with the council, because whether it's JR or myself, we are only one person on the council. We need to, you know, approach those things as a whole. We need to sell, you know, those off as a whole. What is really best? And let's face it, some people have great ideas and maybe they aren't feasible or tangible or what what is best for the city, but I think even in that sense, it's really good to hear what people have to say. And I think another part of that is making yourself approachable, either you know as a city council or as an individual, making yourself approachable in a way where people feel comfortable coming and talking to you and telling you what is on their mind. All right, Mr. Grimm, thank you. Mr. Campos, constituent comes to you with a complaint. How do you respond to that as a council member? Thank you. It's a great question, it's something as a, the incumbent I deal with quite a bit. You see a lot of emails or phone calls, and a lot of it has to do with, as Mr. Grimm said, you listen to what the person's quandary is. And a lot of it has to do predominantly with understanding how their government works. And because you can't necessarily go and collaborate with your peers because you don't want to create a quorum or violate the OPMA, a lot of it is just helping somebody understand what maybe their roles or responsibilities are as a constituent in the city of Pasco. Um, understanding maybe there's a hang up in a permitting process and figuring out where they've been at and then trying to direct them to the right person in the city staff to get that question taken care of. And so a lot of it is, as, as Mr. Grimm pointed out, is just listening. Listening, but you have to understand what your role or responsibility is as a city council member and then helping them understand what their problem actually really is. All right, Mr. Campbell, thank you very much. All right, let's move on to question number three. We'll go back to you for the start here. And this one on the topic of recreational marijuana. Now, here about 11 years on now, the city of Pasco allowing retail <coughs> cannabis uh, to be sold in the city limits. Um, what's one positive and one negative aspect you foresee when it comes to uh, the retail cannabis stores coming into the city limits, Mr. Campos? Another great question. I see a positive is obviously, you know, money coming in. Uh, Sheriff Jim Raymond uh, accused the city council of making a money grab, but if we were making a decision that cost the city financial dollars, we'd be accused of making a poor decision. So I think that we made a smart economic decision, but I do see a downside of it as you look at some of these uh, smoke shops, just your tobacco paraphernalia shops. You see traffic in and out of there. You see a lot of vehicle road trips. Again, it goes back to traffic and people assume that a lot of the people who partake are uh, less than desirable, and that's not necessarily the case. But you're gonna see a lot more traffic and you're gonna see an increase in business in areas where you may not want it. All right, thank you very much. And Mr. Grimm, same question to you. You know, for, for me, I think, <laughs> In a way, there's not a lot of positives from it. I think, you know, allowing people to have liberty and live their lives, that's why I got before the council and spoke to keeping it out in the industrial areas, keeping in the outer lying areas of the, the city and keeping it from the core, keeping it, you know, further away from, from schools and parks and, and such. And one of the proposed stores is not too far from a walking path where there's a school and people are, you know, some people are up in arms about it, and as I've heard it responded, you know, there's there's not a lot, you know, that can be done about it. And so, you know, again, I, um, I, I'm a very liberty-minded individual, and if people, you know, want to partake, I believe that is their own business on their own time. But as the city as a whole, especially um, in our downtown area, especially just in our broad areas of the city, I do not think that it's really the best reflection of really the direction we want to go as a city. All right, Mr. Grimm, thank you very much. All right, our fourth question as we fly along here is on homelessness and a little bit of context. The Benton and Franklin community needs assessment for 2022 showed homeless rate in the Tri-Cities area is three times that of the state of Washington as a whole. So the question is, what ideas do you have to deal with homelessness? Mr. Grimm, we'll start with you here. You know, this is obviously something near and dear to my heart. I volunteer every week down at the Union Gospel Mission. I work with the men down there. I really appreciate what they have called the new life program. And I'm bringing this up because to answer your question, it's an example of how I think we should approach homelessness. It is not, people need a handout once in a while. We all do, every one of us need that. There's times in our life it's not always going the way it should, but we should be helping people up as much as possible. And just to use that program, since I'm really familiar with it, it is about rescuing people, but then loving on them, giving compassion, 
teaching, training, and restoring. It's about restoration of their lives to where they can be contributing members of society. You know what it is? It's a multifaceted issue. Some, some of it's drug abuse. Some of it's mental health issues. Some of it are spiritual issues. And so, you know, it's, I don't think we can approach it as just a one size fits all. But I think for the good of the city and people that maybe want to focus in, um, you know, patronize our downtown businesses, we have to protect those people too at the same point. All right, Mr. Grimm, thank you very much. Mr. Campos, I understand this is not a topic that deserves only one minute of time, <laughs> but unfortunately for this program, that's the time constraints we're under. Um, ideas you have for combating homelessness around Great. here. Yeah, again, uh, Charles hit the nail on the head. There is a lot that can be done to help combat this, but as the role of the city, we don't necessarily engage in what the Union Gospel Mission does, but what we can do as the city is help make sure that areas are zoned to allow for future support. Uh, case in point, the Catholic Family Charities met resistance initially when it came in and tried to establish a center in an area that wasn't zoned correctly, and so the rezone met a lot of resistance. And the community is not necessarily happy that people plan to choose to put, put things like that there, but in the, we need them. We absolutely need them. But as a city council, we can support rezone issues. We can support 501c3s that, that come our way. And we can try to help make sure that our codes and ordinances allow for support in certain areas better than what we do currently. All right, thank you very much, Mr. Campos. Oh, well, uh, question number five, and more of a, a local civics thing for people as they understand what their local government does. Planning and zoning commissions, that may not be the thing at the top of mind for a lot of people, but they make some really important decisions. And so a little bit of clarity as Mr. Campos, you start here. What do you think is the most complicated issue regarding zoning here in Pasco? Our PMC is not, our Pasco Municipal Code is not very clear a lot of times. And so as a commission member who's making decisions like that, you are tasked with making very heavy question answers to a lot of heavy questions that you don't always fully understand. So working with your staff to make sure that you understand the decision that you're making. I would say zoning and ordinances and then dealing with the public. How the public perceives a rezone is a not always a surefire thing that we've, we've approved a project and this project has not the ability to proceed. All we've done is change a designation from a piece of property from one zone to another zone. Often we see projects that ask for the rezone fall by the wayside. Either they've lost funding, uh, they've done a feasibility study and it no longer meets the requirements. So that would be the biggest challenge for our planning commission is to one, make those heavy decisions and fully understand them and then work with the public to understand what they're doing. All right. Thank you very much. Mr. Grimm, same question to you. Most complicated zoning issue in Pasco. I, you know, I don't know if you talk about a specific issue or just the ramifications, you know, can, can be huge if somebody has a plan for a home or maybe it's their life savings and something across the street gets rezoned differently. I mean, those are big decisions, as Mr. Campos said, that can affect a lot of people. There was a recent issue out in East Pasco where um, Mr. Brochi, a longtime community member, was hoping to get an area um, rezoned so he could... Um, really add on to the development that's been so successful out there already. And you know, there, there were reasons, whether substantiated or not, not to do that, but it's a huge ramification as far as affordable housing, what um, you know, the commercial area is gonna look like, industry, how all these are gonna intertwine in those kind of things. And the nuts and bolts of a planning commission where um, Mr. Campos was on the Pasco Planning Commission, I was on a much smaller city, but the city, city of Mesa Planning Commission, it's about writing comprehensive plans, it's about public Hearings. It's about kind of the nuts and bolts of the way the city works and planning those things. And um, yeah, wanted to ask uh, one more question here and question number six, last check. Uh, we were about a year away from swimmers being able to enjoy this new water park that's going up there. What are your expectations regarding the park? Uh, pretty highly anticipated here. Taxpayers supported it. What do you see as some pros and cons, Mr. Grimm? You know, I think it's a, a perfect spot, honestly, out in West Pasco for it. Um, I, I'm really glad that it did ultimately go to the will of voters because it is, you know, that's a huge taxing um, district that is going to fall upon people. And I know the citizenry, they're concerned there, you know, as far as the city of Pasco, they're saying, well, we're paying some of this with our taxes. Are we going to get some kind of, you know, benefit out of it? And I think there's the decision of whether it involves a private partnership. I know there's been some names tossed around with that. I mean, 
mean, ultimately, in and of itself, it could be a good thing, but I think we need to support it with other infrastructure, the ease, whether it be bicycling paths, ease of you know people wanting to go to it. Back to your very first question, as far as traffic and congestion, are we gonna build a Pasco that is inviting for people to come, or are people gonna see it as not worth their hassle? Mr. Grimm, thank you very much. Mr. Campos, same question to you. Pros and cons of that water park coming to town. Great question. A pro, obviously, is tourism. You know, as, as Mr. Grimm pointed out, actually all of Pasco is paying for it out of their taxes. When Benton County opted out of the, um, I think it was a, they voted on it. They opted to vote out. And um, it really should be the gem of Pasco. It should be something that people come to. So that's a pro. It's, it's going to increase our tourism, which helps drive economic um, growth and we want people to want that. The con obviously is is the infrastructure. Um, if we grow too fast and we don't have the infrastructure out there now that Pasco has the limited improvement district, um, or it's the TIP, TIF, tra tax increment financing. Now that they can do the tax increment financing we can build some of the infrastructure prior to so hopefully that con is going to be a lot less than what we would expect but it's likely that that could be a con. All right, gentlemen, well, I, I had warned you that we might not have time for closing statements, but you know what? I think that we do. We uh, saved a little time in this program. I'm going to give you a chance if I can ask our timekeeper and our director back there to reset the clock to one minute. Um, let's do one minute closing statements. A final word from you, Mr. Campos, we'll let you go first. I really have nothing to say other than I'm grateful for the opportunity to be up here and answer as many questions as I can. Uh, again, growing up in Pasco has meant a lot to me. Um, I look at representing district to the best I can. Uh, obviously, since this is a district-based voter system, I really look at our interests first. And a lot of the decisions that we're making on council right now are impacting us just as much as they're impacting everybody else in the city. Um, again, you know, my grandfather owned Sands Mobile Home Court off uh, A Street, for First, first Avenue and Court. Um, and I just have kind of always been up there and spent most of my youth around the Pepsi plant off 26. I was a little kid when I heard the gunshot when Trooper James Saunders was shot. And so I just, I've got deep roots here and, and really am proud to be giving back to my community. Mr. Campbell, thank you for being here. Mr. Grimm, your closing statement, sir. Um, thank you. As you know, just really a lifelong servant again. It's just a chance to serve in another capacity. Um, I've enjoyed civics all the way since high school and even in my early 20s hanging around city councils and you know what has been kind of a hobby and something on the side hoping to really put to use for the, for the good of my business, the good of my family and really the, the good of our community to make Pasco the gem of the Tri-Cities, to make this a place worth protecting, worth fighting for, worth really just seeing come to fruition as um, it's a great place to raise kids, a great place to be proud of. And, you know, w with 20 employees in West Pasco, with five kids that I want to see grow up here, you know, we're in our forever home. I'm invested. This is really important to me to make sure that we protect that quality of life here. And again, thanks to the women, the League of Women Voters and for WSU. WSU Tri-Cities for hosting us today. Well, I want to thank you guys for coming. We really appreciate it. Uh, J.R. Campos, Charles Grimm, uh, candidates for Pasco City Council. We really appreciate your time. And I want to remind uh, voters out there that uh, Mr. Grimm and Mr. Campos on a full ballot of candidates in Franklin County. Before we go, a few key dates for voters out there. Election Day is coming up on November 7th. October 20th is the date for ballots to be mailed out. The deadline to register for mail voting is October 30th. But of course, you can register all the way up to Election Day in person. Now, next in our Vote 2023 series, we'll continue our look at the Pasco City Council. We have a position three race. We have a position five race and a position seven race. If you missed any of our previous programs or anything from tonight, find those full programs on YouTube. Search Northwest Public Broadcasting. We have thanked the candidates, but we want to sign off with one more nod to all of you who've tuned in. Thank you so much for joining us, and thank you for wanting to know more about these people running to serve your community. Have a great night.